future is shooting 800 gigabit per second links at 500 kilometers, maybe even 1,000 kilometers? And what's more, instead of needing a giant box to do these long reach, high speed links, all you need is an optical module that you can stick into a normal network switch. But to get there, I figured why don't we get inside a lab and show you exactly how it works. So we have a lot to cover today, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from SDH, and today we're gonna talk about long range optics because, well, frankly, I saw this demo and I thought this was so cool that I said, well, I have to go and show you guys how this works. And hey guys, I know there are basically two camps of folks that think about optical modules. The first camp is the folks that buy the optical modules, stick them into switches or other network gear or servers or what have you, and uh, that's all they know about them. There are other folks that know all of the equations and get very excited about all of the different things that you can do with light. And so I figured I'm gonna try doing a video that's somewhere in between. So we're gonna show you the, probably like some of the highest end optical modules that you can get today. But at the same time, I'm gonna go and show you how it works and we're not gonna to get too, too far into the super technical stuff. So hopefully most folks can follow along. And of course, because we're here at Marvell's headquarters in Santa Clara, California, both George and I had to travel. We have to say that this video is being sponsored by Marvell. With that, let's get to it. And frankly, when a lot of us do networking, we deal with things like DACs, which are very common to use just inside of a rack, and also things like short range optics, very inexpensive, and uh, you know they're just everywhere, right? Now, let me kind of get into why something like these 800 gig ZR plus optics are a whole nother level. And I thought, let's start with what's inside a DAC or a direct attached copper cable. Now we have a whole thing on this on the STH main site that Rohit did a while ago, but I took apart the uh, housing on this one and this is pretty much what you see inside a three meter, 100 gig DAC. You just essentially see, here's our little gold fingers that attach to our you know slot. And then you see some cables that are attached to the little PCB. Maybe you'll see a little component or two here, but not that many on the PCB. And the big thing here is that there's no conversion from an electrical signal to an optical signal. Instead, it's electric when it comes in on the gold finger side, and it's electric as it's crossing the wires that go to the other side of the cable. Now, taking that next step, up when you have to go further than like three meters, a lot of folks will start with something like a short range optic, which uses a QSFP 28 on one side. So this is our Goldfinger side, electric side. And then on the optical side, we go out to an MTP MPO connector and you can see this an MPO MTP 12. And because it's a hundred gig SR4 optic, we know that we have four channels. Let's open this up and show you what a lower cost optical module looks like. You'll see that we have the uh, outer part of the casing here. Then we have the casing on the other side. Now this is our connector. And you can see that we have our little short optical pigtail to the rear of the module. And what you'll see when we pull it out of the casing is essentially we have our electrical module, we have a little chip on this side, and then we go to the other side and that's kind of where our optical conversion is happening and going out to our connector on the back. Very small PCB, very few components and small components. And that's why a module like this can be produced in high quantity, very inexpensively, because you know if you're only going say 100 meters, you don't really wanna have something that costs a ton, you want something that you can produce a ton of and make them inexpensive, right? So this is a pretty simple optical module, but at least it kind of shows you a spectrum. And that's exactly why when I saw this demo, I knew that I had to go and show you guys what's going on. Because think about it, this is 100 gigs, 100 meters. When we start talking about going 800 gigs at a distance that's like 10,000 times as far, so eight times faster, 10,000 times as far, the complexity to get something that's packaged only a little bit larger than this is absolutely wild. So, well, let's kind of talk about long range optics now. Now, pluggable optics in the data center, they span a wide variety of form factors, and we're really talking about a specific one, which is this right here. But let's talk about where the different optical modules are used and why. So first off, if you're gonna go maybe three meters or less, especially inside a rack, that tends to be the domain of electrical cables or really copper cables. And frankly, if you're gonna go less than three meters, there's very little reason to actually go into the optical space, it's just much more power efficient, reliable, and folks just generally from a cost perspective will go with electrical cables, whether those are passive electrical or active electrical cables. And so there are a number of different modules and let's talk about these first. Now, if you wanna go somewhere from maybe that three meters up to maybe two kilometers, you might use something like these. Now these are PAM4 modulated modules and these are really the ones that, you know, you'd stick in your normal server switches, NICs, all of those types of devices. And the reason for this is that they tend to be lower cost optics because they're 
using just easier encoding schemes. But what's happening these days is you need to go further. Two kilometers might get you from one data hall to another data hall, especially because you know fiber optic cable goes up and you know is conduits and all that kind of stuff. So it goes a long way, even if it doesn't look like it's physically going a far distance. A lot of times the actual cable links are a lot larger. Going inside a campus, you can generally do that with lower cost optics. But when you have to start bridging long distances, let's say that you have a campus that spans different parts of a metro area, or you have something like you have a data center that's in the Bay Area of California, and then you also have one that's in Los Angeles because you have these around different population centers. Well, if that's the case, then that's where we get these wonderful colors line. And this is really something that Marvell and Infi, the predecessor company that really developed this technology that Marvell bought, they really came up with this. Now, this is the 100 gig module that you might have seen, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe eight to 10 years ago. And it didn't have a distance that was crazy necessarily, but this could go maybe 80 kilometers. So inside the Bay Area, if you just needed connectivity, then this type of module would make a lot of sense. And it went at 100 gigs and you could put into a standard server or switch and that was really attractive. But then folks said they wanted to go faster. So instead of 100 gig, now we have things like 400 gig modules. And the 400 gig one goes somewhere in that maybe like 120 to 400 kilometer range, but at 400 gigabits per second, which is awesome. Again, you can see this is a pretty reasonable form factor. Now, if you want to go further and faster, that's when you start using what we're looking at today. And that is this module. This is an 800 gigabit per second ZR plus module. Now with these ZR plus modules, folks found that they could get about 500 kilometers at 800 gigabits per second. And then through some things like PCS, you can actually take that all the way out to a thousand kilometers at 800 gigabits per second. If you want to go a little bit further than that, you can also drop the data rate and you can drop that down to 600. And if you get all the way down to like 400 gigs in a module, an OSFP module like this, you can get something like 2,000, 2,500 kilometers. And the big reason that this matters is because, well, this was your alternative beforehand. This is a CFP2 module. One of the things that you'll immediately notice if, I, if you're looking at these side by side is that the CFP module is much larger. So one of the things that you would deploy would be an entire box. It would be like a server size box. It would use a lot of power. And then you'd plug something like this in and that would give you your long range, long reach connection. Now, on the other hand, what you can do with a OSFP ZR Plus module like this is you can drive that connection going all the way from Santa Clara to Austin at 400 gigabits per second directly out of a switch. You don't need that extra box. You don't need a different form factor module. Instead, you get just to plug this into your switch and go fast and far. Now, one of the big reasons that we're looking at these optical modules today is because of this little tiny chip, which is the Marvell Orion DSP, which sits inside one of these modules. And there's a bunch of other components. So, well, uh, let's get over and understand how a coherent module works. Okay, so we've already talked a lot about why you need these types of ZR modules for distance and also why you need coherent modules. But what does that coherent mean? And more practically, what does it look like? So when we take a module like this, we can't really go inside and really show you all of the little tiny components. Millimeter placement of different components, also how they're stacked together to put them into such a small package. That's all trade secrets, so we can't really show that. But instead, what we have behind me is we have a test platform, an evaluation platform, that we can actually show you just kind of in an engineering sense what's going on inside one of these modules. So to show this real quick, I'm just gonna take this ZR module, which is a pluggable module, very easy to go plug in. And I'm gonna show you this next to the reference platform. Here's what's going on here. You can see that we have our normal send and receive, our optical side here, and we have our electrical side on the other side of the module. And that's replicated on this engineering board. What you'll see on this text fixture is that we have our electrical side here. So it's our electrical signal, which could be coming from something like a switch, for example, like the Terralynx 10 that we looked at earlier last year. That electrical signal is going into the Orion DSP. And the reason that you need this DSP is because this is a very high speed signal. It's often going over a cable or a PCB connection. So there's a lot of noise and so you need to clean up that signal before it goes into your optical components. And so really what that DSP is there is just to make sure that the signal coming through each side is clean. Now from the Orion DSP, the next step is to go into the CDM or Coherent Driver Modulator. Inside of this little box in here is all the components you need to drive a light source. 
and also modulate that light source so that way you can transmit information over the little fiber optic cable that's coming out of this end. And so to distill that even further, what that means is that you are going in this little CDM module from an electrical signal into an optical signal. Now, this side is the receive side or the ICR, integrated coherent receiver. Now, the first thing you're gonna notice is that there are two fiber optic connections coming in here. One comes from the local oscillator, which we'll talk about in a second, but the other one is really our receive signal. Now, inside the ICR, it's a 90 degree hybrid. Now, that is a passive optical component, which really helps us maintain our phase and also our magnitude information, so of the optical signals. And then from there, it goes into a photo detector. That photo detector takes the light information and converts it into a current, so electrical. And then we have a TIA, which is a trans impedance amplifier. And what that does is adds voltage really to that current. And so in summary, what this ICR is, is it takes an optical signal converts it to an electrical signal that then goes into the Orion DSP. From the Orion DSP, you then have an electrical signal that can go out to the rest of the system. Okay, so you've probably heard me say coherent detection, and you're probably wondering what's the difference between direct detection and coherent detection. So we have some math behind that that we're gonna get into for the next two hours. Oh wait, no, actually, I'm just gonna let you guys look that up yourself because frankly, uh, this is a long video and there are people that are much more qualified to go and teach you this than I am. All right, so instead of doing all of that math and losing a lot of folks, let's try up-leveling this just a little bit and talking about why we call these coherent modules and uh, what the big deal is about that. So a lot of folks understand a just kind of normal wire. You either have a signal or don't have a signal that kind of gives you your one and zeros. And then you have other encoding schemes that allow you to have multiple different readings on that same wire. But when we talk about light, you get to do a lot of really cool things that you just kind of can't do as much on a normal electrical signal. And one of those is this coherent encoding scheme. And let me just show you an example right here. Instead of a simple eye diagram, we have things called constellations. And we have both our X and Y polarization. And so you're gonna see that each one has 16 different, these are called constellations. And these are really how we encode and transmit information. And we're able to detect that on the other side and be able to reliably transmit information over long distances. And so let's make this a little bit more practical. The way that we get this information and we're able to decipher this information in the ICR on that receive side is we have that local oscillator that we showed you. Now that local oscillator gives us that reference laser and that reference light source. So that way we can do the comparison and get the information out reliably on the other end. So that brings us to a really important point. On the optical side, you can do a bunch of different techniques to encode information in more interesting and more elegant ways than you can do on a simple electrical wire. And the other huge advantage of that is that you can then transmit that information over long distances. Remember, this Orion DSP is there, and one of the big reasons it's there is to clean up an electrical signal that's going this far. On the other end of the optical side, we could be going a thousand kilometers. And frankly, there is no way that you could go thousands of kilometers if you're talking about going, you know, maybe a couple inches, maybe three meters without having to repeat the signal. Okay, now in all these videos, I like to have key lessons learned. And first off, like this was just cool to see, right? Now, let me set a little bit of context here. Let's say that you either are building a giant AI cluster or you're looking to invest in companies that build AI data centers, AI clusters, AI infrastructure, all that kind of stuff. Well, one of the big challenges that folks are talking about in the industry is just frankly power. We're no longer at the era where, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago at STH, we were testing servers that like 1U was using, I don't know, 500, 600 watts. We're not even at a one kilowatt per U, we're way beyond that. And another thing that has changed is just how many network links you need. When we started reviewing the AI servers or deep learning servers back then, about 10 years ago, something that we would see very commonly would be that you'd have maybe one NIC per eight GPUs, or there were other topologies that would have maybe one NIC for a pair of GPUs or for four GPUs or something like that. But these days you have a 400 gig connection per NIC at minimum. And that means that on both sides of the link, you need a 400 gigabit you know, on the GPU side and you need 400 gigabits on the network side. So it turns out that networking becomes a giant factor in being able to scale AI clusters. But the other thing that is a, uh, it's frankly a huge challenge is getting enough power. In today's AI clusters, we're not talking about like a one megawatt cluster or 10 or a hundred megawatt cluster. We're literally talking about people that are going out, buying power and like, 
putting the data center directly next to power plants because they need that scale of power. And that's why I was totally jazzed to see these 800 gig colors modules, which are 800 gig ZR plus modules from Marvell and a number of their partners. Because here's the thing, once you break the limits of just being able to do a campus or something maybe a little bit larger, like a city in terms of how far you can reach your networking, all of a sudden opportunities abound, right? Because now you can go and have data centers next to multiple power sources and then just bring the network all the way to those different power sources. But don't take my word for it. Let's do a phone a friend to Chris Sharp, who is CTO at Digital Realty Trust. They operate so many data centers. They're one of the biggest in the world on that. And so let's just ask him what he thinks. Our customers can't be constrained by the four walls of the data center. As inference AI matures, clusters must span large geographies to keep computing close to the power sources and users. Having 800 gig or multiple 800 gig links from a standard pluggable optics is a game changer for the future of AI connectivity. Now, of course, we're talking about AI here because that's the hot application and it is driving just a huge number of like high-speed network ports. But on the other hand, you may just want to use this for other reasons. But if you can go either build or of course lease dark fiber between your data center and somewhere else or your campus and somewhere else, you can all of a sudden extend your campus to somewhere that's a lower cost, right? Or maybe it's more disaster proof or whatever it is. Let's say for example, you want to go and extend your data center from the Silicon Valley or from Los Angeles to Phoenix, Arizona. There are tons of data centers in Arizona because well, it doesn't really have that many natural disasters, number one. And number two, it's also much less expensive than California California while remaining relatively close. And so if you can light up some dark fiber using these 800 gig ZR plus modules, all of a sudden you can just use your switch and make your LAN or your WAN, I guess, extend all the way to another data center that's in a completely different state without having to go and really do a lot of the fancy things you'd normally need to. And here's the crazy part, guys. This is what we're doing in 2025, but the networking industry is on a normal cadence of getting like twice as fast every generation. And so when we look ahead to, you know, maybe 12 months or 18 months from now, I mean, it's just wild what you can do with networking these days. Hey guys, I hope you learned something with this video because I sure as heck did. And if you learned something or you had an idea for an application or something, go put that down in the comments. But also, well, why don't you share this with your friends and colleagues, but also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on the notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.